So I, I'm going to tell you about the the kind of work that that Deidre Kettner and I have been doing for several decades now, and um, it's it's all about how to build human-like AI systems. So I want to understand minds by building them. And one thing you don't do if you look at human beings is you don't uh, lock a child away in a closet with a stack of reading material and a stack of picture books and a stack of videos and leave them alone and expect them to come out um, <laughs> a whole fluent, intelligent being. We, we just don't do that, right? And so you, you look at human learning and it's really different than the sort of things that machine learning people are doing today. And I think that's that's a problem. So I'm gonna tell you three hypotheses we've been exploring about human cognition. And, and then I'll go in detail about qualitative representations and how they're kind of conceptual currency, if you will, that lets you actually um, have a natural way to express many continuous things. And analogical learning, which gives you an incremental, inspectable, data and training efficient learning method. So it has a lot of advantages. And then I'll wrap up with some conclusions about where we're going next. Okay, so here's the three hypotheses, the big picture, the really big picture, and I'll, I'll drill down into each of these incrementally. So, so the first is the qualitative representations are how people reason and learn about the continuous world. So if I'm telling someone about how something works, I may say, well, if you press harder here, it'll squeeze over there, okay? The causal statement, the kind of thing you might tell someone who's trying to learn how a machine works. And it, there is some differential equation that describes that system, but you don't know what it is, and they don't know what it is, and they don't need to know what it is because what you just said was enough. It's also an important component of natural language semantics and also visual semantics. And, and you'll see what I mean about visual semantics in, in just a few minutes. The second hypothesis is that analogy is used throughout cognition. And, and by throughout, I mean from visual reasoning up through conceptual change in every place in between. It's, it's incremental. Even adding one new case gives you the ability to learn new things. It's data efficient in part because it's using relational representations. And it's inspectable because these relational representations can easily be apprehended by people compared to handing them a, a bunch of tensors or vectors or matrices. <clears throat> then human intelligence comes from being social organisms. This, this ties directly into your co-construction theme. They, they are able to adapt and guide their own learning. If you're going to participate in a social interaction, you have to be an agent. Uh, one thing you see about most AI systems today is they aren't really agents. They may be called agents, but they don't have agency in the sense that, uh, for instance, Mike Tomasello uses the term. They have to be able to learn from and work with others. And we're exploring this idea through the companion cognitive architecture. A lot of the experiments you're going to see today are done on top of the companion's cognitive architecture, but I won't talk too much about it. I'll just tell you a little bit about that because that's that's background compared to um, the, the main ideas about qualitative representations and analogy. So I'm now gonna start drilling down a little bit into the hypotheses in a little bit more detail before really doing a deep dive. So yeah, qualitative representations serve a number of purposes for us. First, they're a bridge between perception and cognition. If I wanna talk about putting something on the table, I have to know what kind of locations on the table means. So I have to go from the symbolic descriptions that are used in everyday language to a symbolic representation of space that lets me know what's acceptable. And this kind of link has been explored heavily in vision. It's probably true for audition and touch as well, but those really haven't been explored yet. Um, I think those are interesting frontiers. It's a basis for common sense reasoning. So if you drop a pressurized can into a fireplace, you know that you better get the can out of there really fast or you better get away, right? Without knowing exactly how full the can is, you know the thing could heat up and explode. And again, if you had to go gather all the numbers, um, you'd be dead before you got the information you needed. 
So that really isn't something that you want to be doing. Now, it's also a foundation for expert reasoning. So the fact that I have something that may be subject to heat stress and it's got pressure inside it, like a pressure cooker on a stove, I have to now have as a constraint that it doesn't blow up. That, that is something to think about, that that's a question to raise about the system comes from your qualitative descriptions of everyday, the everyday world. So to actually do the analysis to show that your pressure cooker is safe requires numerical information, but to know that's a relevant question, that's what qualitative representations do for you. And the final thing is it's a component of natural language semantics. That's kind of obvious with spatial terms, but it's also true for things like um, talking about the temperature rising when you're cooking something on the stove, becoming constant when you're boiling things, at least in the open. And so there's a, all the sort of things we do with continuous parameters. And, and by the way, not just physical. Someone, um, I, I'm, I, I would do this in interacting with this person, but if I do, that'll really get them even more angry. So that's a continuous description. We don't have units for anger, right? There's no numerical value for anger. There's no units for anger. And yet we can talk about increasing, decreasing, diffusing a situation. All those things are talking about properties of us as thinking beings and emotional beings in terms of continuous parameters that we have qualitative descriptions for. So qualitative representations are very powerful. Now, analogy, we're using Dedry Gettner structure mapping theory. That's Dedry on the upper right. The idea is that analogy involves correspondences between components of structured representations. So these are two descriptions. This is from a description of, of water leaking out of a bucket. And this is a description of heat leaving a house. And these were automatically produced by a natural language system in understanding an analogy where someone explains heat leaking from the house in terms of water leaking from a bucket. So there's entities involved in the description and there's relationships that connect those in various ways. And what analogy is doing is it's making correspondences, what goes with what? And then it's filling in missing structure. So if I reduce the amount of leakage in the bucket, I, could, I have less water leaking out and so it is with the heat. That's a candidate inference. You're projecting information. So analogy tells you what goes with what, which helps you spot differences. It also tells you um, how to complete a pattern. Now, looking at this, these correspondences, um, SME, our, our model, also computes a numerical similarity value. So the kind of numerical similarity value that people use for judging similarity actually falls out of the same kind of computation. Now, there's a large body of psychological evidence for this theory. And again, the psychological evidence involves things from medium level vision up through reasoning and conceptual change and a lot of places in between. And so in addition to the psychological evidence, we now have computational models that actually capture a lot of the same phenomena. So let's talk about that. So the structure mapping engine captures the matching process. So here's a description we're trying to understand, a relational representation. Here is a prior case or a generalization constructed from prior cases by a process I'll show you in a few minutes. And it's making correspondences and projecting inferences to reason about that new case. You can think of this kind of like applying a rule, except this, these don't have to be logically quantified. They can be particular examples, or you can also apply rules this way, it turns out. Now, where do you get this? Well, there's a model called MACFAC, many are called, few are chosen, that retrieves these from a large knowledge base. And so as you have experience, you take that experience and store it away, and you can store it away, just store it away, but you can also compare it to other similar things. And that's where SAGE, Sequential Analogical Generalization Engine comes in. If it finds similar things, it mushes them together. And by mushing them together, 
it constructs probability, right? Because if two things, two statements match in the examples, they're probably one for the first two. And if they don't match, it's probability 50%. And as you keep mushing things together, these probabilities represent the frequencies of things in the world for that particular kind of description. So SAGE produces probabilistic relational schemas that are partially abstracted, but they don't have logical variables. So, so these things together is, is kind of the essence of the companion cognitive architecture. So this is how we think a lot of human cognition works. Now, there's lots of other things in the architecture as well. You have to set up the cases sometimes. You have to reason about whether or not an inference is sound. There's all sorts of background reasoning and glue reasoning and stuff involved in language understanding. But, but like things that make this unique as a story, this is what makes it unique. Now, our approach, there's many cognitive architectures. Many of them are about skills. So, for example, um, if you look at SOAR, SOAR has been used lately for what's called interactive task learning, which is right up your alley of co-construction. It's very interesting stuff. Um, but we don't worry about skills. Skills are nice. You don't want to be unskilled. But we're, we're trying to understand things at a higher level of abstraction. So, so we're thinking in terms of how do you build software social organisms? And by that, I mean things that work with people using natural modalities. So for us, that's sketching, natural language, now vision and speech. Those are recent additions. I'll tell you more about those in a few minutes. That can learn and adapt over extended periods of time. People don't learn in the factory and then pop out in the world and never learn again. That's crazy, right? And, and your hypothesis also is that's crazy and that's the right, the right direction to be going in. Now that also implies that your systems have to maintain themselves. You don't wanna have an expert human have to sit around with every machine and say, well, that machine just had this experience. Oh, let me debug the way the thing's internal structures work. This is a huge challenge. This is a major challenge. In fact, in doing the, the AI roadmap for the United States, uh, there's a whole section in here about this kind of self-maintenance and how to do that. Not how, but, but like milestones in doing that. Now, why social? Well, so Lev Vygotsky back in the 1930s pointed out that a lot of our knowledge is learned by interactions with other people. And robots are a great way to gather knowledge about the physical world. But there's also the social world and the mental world and the cultural worlds. And many things we understand we've never directly experienced. So if you were around, if you experienced the American Revolutionary War or similar historical phenomena, I'd like to talk to you offline because that means either you've invented time travel or immortality, right? No one in this call has experienced those directly, yet we have knowledge about the molecular structure. Plate tectonics, same thing. If you saw the Galapagos being formed, let's talk, okay? Um, so there's, these, these are also an important part of being um, a human being in our culture. So that's why social organisms. I think it's also the best way to bootstrap for a lot of, a lot of reasons. Okay, so now let's, let's get into qualitative representations. So, so the essence of qualitative representation is to provide a symbolic description of continuous phenomena. So I can talk about a temperature, by ordinal relations involving freezing point and boiling point for liquids. I can talk about the region of space above a table. And those are two ways of going from the unruly continuous world to a symbolic thing that you can talk about and put properties on. Now, they also provide causal models that operate with very little data. So if I have heat flowing into a liquid, its temperature increases unless it's boiling, in which case the heat that's being added goes into changing the state of the molecules, et cetera. But you can actually model all that with purely qualitative representations. And this turns out to be synergistic with analogical reasoning because remember those analogy descriptions were in terms of symbolic representations, relational descriptions that link entities. So analogy turns out also supports rapid qualitative reasoning and qualitative representations in turn support analogical learning. It's a kind of virtuous cycle. So let me start out with some spatial reasoning stuff because um, our, our Cox sketch model may be very interesting to you. People have used it for robotics before. Um, 
There's a person in Slovenia who actually uses it to sketch robot plans. I don't know much about what he does. He just complained when we took a picture out one year and wanted it back in. We put it back in for him. Um, but but Cog Sketch basically shows you you can model visual reasoning using qualitative reasoning and analogy. Cog Sketch has two roles. It's a cognitive science research instrument. So we can model high level human vision and spatial representations. The first thing we did with it uh, was model all sorts of visual problem solving. So if you download Cog Sketch, you'll see this geometric analogy problem. And in fact, all the classic Evans problems, you can run them. You can see why Cog Sketch gets the answers it gets. Um, this is a, an example of from an experiment that Dahan and Spelke did with Americans in Munduruku. Basically, it switches the odd one out. And the Cog Sketch model, again, gets human-like answers. What's hard for the model is hard for people and vice versa. And you can do ablation studies on the model, obviously, not on the people, and get an explanation for why those particular things are happening. Um, the final example on the right is Raven's progressive matrices. Turns out Raven's is the single best test of human fluid intelligence. The Cog Sketch model is in the 76th percentile, meaning it's better than most Americans at this task. It doesn't mean it has that much fluid intelligence. It means that what Ravens is actually measuring is a capability to do qualitative reasoning and analogy and visual re-representation over visual stimuli. And re-representation is the hard part, changing your mental set. Okay. Now, in addition to doing that, if you have software that sees things the way people do, you can put it to work. And two ways we put it to work is a platform for new kinds of educational software. The first kind of the design coach, um, if you have sketches, you can also make a kind of comic strip where the student actually shows you how they intend their system to work. And the design coach is acting like a crash test dummy, right? They're trying to explain something and practice explaining something. It turns out engineering students have trouble with that. Who knew? Um, and they basically get to, to learn how to do it better in a safe way. The other um, sketch worksheets I'm going to drill down into because it's a very, very general model and shows you the power of how a little bit of analogy and QR can, can work wonders. So that means I'm going to have to show you how the structure mapping engine works. So here's two fish, actually from another data set you'll see a little bit later. And so in this description, the dorsal fin is above the body, the pelvic fin is below the body, and this one has a dorsal fin, doesn't have a pelvic fin. These are incomplete descriptions just to make the point about how it works. SME works by <clears throat> finding local matches between things. So it starts with relations and then uses those to infer what the entity bindings are. You know, if you think about graph matching, it's an MP complete problem. It's worst case factorial. Top down, factorial. Bottom up, factorial. Middle out, greedy, is actually n squared log n. And so that makes a good way to approximate what's going on. You can take the things that were connected to the mapping, but not mapped, and those become your candidate inferences. And of course, given all these things, you can compute a similarity score. So that's how SME works. Now, let's think about sketch worksheets. So you're an instructor, and say you're in geoscience, because they sketch a lot. They sketch perhaps more than any other science domain. Okay. So, so sketching is something they want to assign, but they tend not to. They do very little sketching in terms of assignments because they're so hard to grade. So this is an example from a geoscience class at Northwestern. It's a partial explanation of how the greenhouse effect works. We did this worksheet because the instructor always gives this problem on the final exam, tells the students he's going to give it to them on the final exam, and they still get it wrong. Drives him nuts. Okay, so. So the problem is grading these things takes a long time. In an engineering design course, sketches done in the second week of class often don't get turned back until the last week of class, by which time the students have forgotten everything and they didn't learn anything from it. So that's a real problem. 
So feedback delayed is feedback almost useless. So CogSketch lets you provide on the spot feedback. By the way, this worksheet is in the distribution. If you download CogSketch, you can give it a try. And so if you have a state like this and you press the feedback button, here's the feedback it'll give you. Oh, I don't can't see how the atmosphere helps warm the planet. And then ask you some leading questions. Now, very key thing about educational software, if you want it to spread, you can't be the ones writing it. It's the instructors and domain experts who have to write it. So this English was not generated automatically. This natural language was generated by an instructor and they knew they were working with college students and so that's that determines the level of text they use. They knew the language in the classroom was English so they used English instead of German or French or Italian. And so you put in whatever you think is appropriate in whatever language is the right language for you and the same thing, by the way, is true of all the concepts that the thing shows you, right? Because we want this thing totally customizable. And so what it's doing is it's matching the expert sketch against the student work using SME. And so the authoring environment lets domain experts build new sketch sheets. It's been deployed at Northwestern and other universities. Um, it gives you an order of magnitude improvement in grading efficiency. And, and believe me, that's a, that's a major thing for instructors. So here's how they work. This is Bridget Garnier, who's a grad student at University of Wisconsin, who actually authored an entire geoscience introductory course worth of, of worksheets, and they're now publicly available. So she draws her sketch, Cox sketch analyzes it, and she marks up the important facts in the grading rubrics using the interface we provide. Now, when she hands it out to a student, the student does their sketch, Cog sketch does the same analysis on it and then uses SME to compare them. That analogical match provides differences, and those differences are filtered by, a tut by tutoring rules and the advice that the person put in to generate advice for the student, which goes back to the student as feedback, like you saw, but also provides assessment data to the instructor. So the instructor has complete timing data as well as when the student asks for help, as well as, well, pretty much everything you want to know, okay? So all that's in the background. So, so this is now being used in geoscience fairly heavily. Um, and again, order of magnitude, more efficient than grading paper worksheets. Um, Bridget actually did two sections one year and did everything on paper in one and everything in cog sketch on the other. And so, um, that's how we know that these things really scale. Um, we've also used them in Northwestern AI classes as well as geoscience classes um, in knowledge representation and reasoning. Um, and one thing I found is that students on a tough assignment, um, if they had feedback, 78% of them got a perfect score. That never happens on tough assignments in my classroom anyway. Um, and you give them a similarly tough assignment, although not, completely calibrated, 22% uh, got a perfect score without feedback, which is more in line with my own experience anyway. So, so this feedback can actually help. So um, more instructors are adopting it. We now have it available um, basically through Amazon Web Services, not as a commercial product. It's you, you talk to us, we'll tell you, tell you how to set it up with Amazon, uh, all very informal right now. Okay. Now, in addition to helping students, we've also tried to model science and technology and engineering and math, reasoning and learning. So this is a part of a basic science textbook that the Navy uses to teach sailors how to do things. It's on basic machines. So this is simplified English from the original. Uh, this is back in 2007, okay? Um, so Kate Lockwood was doing this work and one thing she notices, there's these diagrams here, which she sketched. And how do you merge the information from a sketch and text? Well, Richard Mayer, a psychologist said, well, what you do is you take your understanding of the text and you take your understanding of the diagram and you align them. Kate, of course, said, align. We know how to do that. We use SME for that. And that's in fact what she did. 
So after reading a, a simplified natural language version of the chapter, the system was able to correctly answer 12 out of 15 homework questions. So that was that was the first hint that multimodal learning could be done this way. Second example by Maria Chang, what she did um, was basically do a bunch of analogies from a middle school science book for teachers and showed similar learning results for um, for student for for the software. Um, she also showed you could use analogy and QR to solve things like conceptual ranking problems. So which one of these ropes pulling out a stump provides the most force? Well, it's pretty easy to see if you think about vectors and adding vectors. Um, and basically, um, she showed that you could solve these sorts of problems using qualitative representations and sketching the problems. Now, I mentioned language. <clears throat> Our approach to language is a little bit different than large language models. Uh, so we're using James Allen's parser, which is a classic chart parser. Um, we have a discourse representation theory pack semantics builder. If you're a fan of natural language and you haven't used discourse representation theory, you should look into it. It's wonderful. DRT is why we can do a lot of the clever stuff we do. So we're using the open psych ontology in our next KB, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, we get from DRT logical and numerical quantification. Um, 20 species of fish may become extinct. Um, quotation, quote, go ahead with the program. I don't care about the environment, end quote, says the vice president. That's from an example in moral decision making that we've done. Um, counterfactuals. If the dam is open, 20 species of fish will become extinct. DRT lets you handle all that. And the sort of context mechanism they talk about can be very nicely implemented using psych style um, micro theories. Now, natural language has ambiguity. So one of the ways we resolve that is by using um, a query based abductive system that uses task information to figure out, given the task, what's the most sensible meaning here? And you're going to see a way where that actually gets extended by analogy in, in just a few minutes. So we've used this language system in learning by reading text, multimodal learning by reading. We've also used it in moral decision making and conceptual change modeling. You'll see a couple of examples of conceptual change a little bit later on. Now, <laughs> stepping back, one thing that's different about this approach is we assume that there's many layers in representing language. So the lower layers are general purpose, lexicon, syntactic analysis, semantic choice sets, discourse representation structures. These are all independent of task and domain. I mean, humans don't have a separate language box for everything they do. If you look at work that learns semantic parsing, it takes a lot of data. And part of it is they're trying to learn all this stuff all at once, in addition to the higher level knowledge. Now, the higher levels linked to more cognitive concerns. And, and here we're, we're inspired a lot by James Allen's collaborative problem solving dialogue model, which I think is probably the most interesting dialogue model in terms of making interactive systems. So the next level up, what we call narrative function, and these are, these are more domain specific. So if I'm giving you advice in a strategy game, building a university in a city increases its science output literally a piece of advice one of our experiments um, then the ad gets interpreted as an action that causes there to be one of those things in there right and that's specific to the strategy game um, and so we actually have narrative functions some built by hand some learned by analogy and even higher level recognizing the intent of something Someone told me that in order to give me advice to help me play the game better. So now, so there's a lot of knowledge involved here. So next KP is our knowledge base and it provides the kind of relational representations that you need to have the expressive capacity for reasoning interpretability. As, we, as per the link down here, it's publicly available, Creative Commons attribution license. It's a subset of OpenSight for the skeleton 82,000 concepts, 31,000 predicates, about 1,000 micro theories. 
um, integrated language resources, not only for English, sorry. Um, but we have mappings between OpenSight and FrameNet. And by the way, there are FrameNets for other languages, I understand. And if you've got mappings for the frames, because I think the frames are mostly independent, then that might actually be a way of applying this to other languages. Large lexicon, in fact, is even bigger than those numbers, because those are old numbers. And all the representations for all the things that we're talking that I'm talking about here, they're all in NextKB. Now, to actually do a lot of the reasoning, there's code that's hooked up to the representations of procedural attachments. So to kick off analogical matching or retrieval generalization, it looks like a query to the system. But underneath, of course, so these anal analogy models are doing the hard work. So, so just the knowledge base doesn't give you the ability to do everything, but does give you the ability to hook stuff up together and and use the ways of gluing things together to do higher order stuff. So next KB is a work in progress. We hope people will find it useful and we hope others will help us build it out. We stopped using Research Psych years ago because Research Psych was never going to be publicly available. And, and that to us seems like a tragedy. Research Psych has a lot of beautiful knowledge material. Research Psych has a lot of very clever inference routines. In some ways, our system is better than Research Psych. In other ways, Research Psych is a lot better than our system. Um, you know, they've been they've they've learned a lot over the decades of, of building psych. But to us, being able to pass it out on street corners and make it publicly available dominates. And we're hoping that by doing all this learning by reading and interaction with people, we can build back up same or better level of inference machinery than even research like has. Now you can you can download files and binaries that use it. Cogsketch uses it. Case mapper is basically a way of exploring analogical matching and retrieval for cognitive scientists. And that's that really is cross-platform. Max by courtesy of uh, VirtualBox. We're probably going to switch to Docker at some point because VirtualBox is getting kind of cranky. Um, and we're going to stick the content files on GitHub, but we're not there yet. Okay, so now let's let's double down on that vision bit. I said high level vision, and you can see that the visual problem solving and reasoning are all sort of high level vision. But what about let's go hardcore and say now we're going to do it for recognition. So so hypothesis here is that qualitative visual representations. And then logical learning gives you data efficiency and interpretability, even for learning object recognition. And this is work from Kazan Chen's recent PhD thesis. David Marr's primal sketch was a revolution in computer vision back in the 70s. And what we're doing is updating it for the 21st century. So in addition to edge finders, like David used, the candy edge finder is in fact a product of that research group, other things like Potrace, and then various deep learning components. Because if you think about what a deep learning component is doing for vision, like mass scar CNN, it's saying, well, here's this object here in the world, and here's either a bounding box or, or an outline, and here's a word that's labeling it. Well, you know, CogSketch takes digital ink as input. We can translate that boundary into digital ink. And we can use the word in CogSketch's lexicon to translate that into a concept. So it's like someone is magically handing CogSketch glyphs where we don't have to trace over it by hand, but the deep learning component's doing it for us. And that lets us then put this information into SAGE, our model of analogical generalization, and learn from that. Which means now I have to tell you how SAGE works. So now let's say, you're a negligent parent who lets their child watch lots and lots of Saturday morning cartoons, and they're going to learn about animals from that. So here's a dog, four legs, two ears, barks, wags his tail, drools. It's yellow in color, okay? Um, here's another dog, four legs, two ears, barks, wags tail, etc. And so you say, well, they're similar, so I'm going to mush them together. And so that generalization um, 
four legs, two ears, bark, spikes, tail, 100%. Um, and then drools half the time, flying ace half the time, et cetera. Now, if I just have two, it's sort of easy to think about what to compare against. But if I have more than two, then I have to retrieve something, right? So that's where MacVac comes in. So SMEs order in squared log n, and that's fine for small numbers of things. But if I have a memory pool that's got millions of items, that obviously doesn't scale. So the first stage has a very clever vector representation automatically computed from the structured description. And that description is an estimate of what SME will produce. So you take the best n, where n is between three, and in some cases goes all the way up to 16. And then the second stage, you use SME to do that retrieval. And so you have a method that turns out matches nicely the psychology of analogical retrieval, but is very efficient. So now we keep adding things to that generalization and eventually all the uninteresting properties wear away. Now, there's more than one concept, right? You're not just learning about dogs. So in, for a generalization pool, this is your analogical model of a concept, you have generalizations corresponding to different things that you've seen and examples, outliers that don't fit into a generalization yet. So suppose I now have a new example coming in. If the closest thing I retrieve is a generalization and it's sufficiently similar, then I merge those things. If I have an outlier and that gets retrieved, then I merge those into a new generalization. And if it's totally different than everything else, I add it to the list of outliers. So what's cool about this is, think, think about k-means plus outliers, right? This is k-means plus outliers, but you don't have to say what k is in advance. That comes out of the data for you automatically. So we're very excited about this. And of course, it's incremental. So here's, an, here's how we've been using this in vision. The TU Berlin data set, 250 concepts they claim covers all of everyday life. It includes things like hand grenades and UFOs. So their everyday life is much more exciting than my everyday life. Um, if you look at what our part-based analogical learning does, it's better than most deep learning approaches. There are some that beat it by basically using massive more amounts of data and pre-training. Uh, but if you don't pre-train, we do as well as the best of the deep learning systems. Now, data efficiency is something that we think is very important. So we built a data set expressly to evaluate that. So the color book object data set has something like 22 categories, only 10 examples per category. Only 10. So Lynette gives you way less than chance accuracy. ResNet 50, less than chance accuracy. This is slightly above chance if you pre-train it with a lot of stuff. Um, it still doesn't beat straightforward, simple, single analogy at 29%. And we have a new hierarchical analogical learning technique that gets us up to 37%. And again, you know, not, not sealing by any means, uh, but still doing better than these other methods. Visual relation detection. This is a great example of the deep learning system saying, this is a tie, that's a person, and now using things like RCC8 relationships and other qualitative spatial relationships, computing lists, we can construct generalizations. We get comparable to state of the art when the ground truth categories are known. Um, we only process the training set once versus eight to 35 epochs for deep learning systems and we get inspectable results. Let me show you what I mean by inspectable. So here's two generalizations, one from above and one from where's. You notice that for above, you've got RCC8 partially overlap. The area of the first thing is 01. In this generalization, it's most likely sky, and the things below it are buildings, trees, and mountains. Okay, so this is, by the way, one generalization out of about a dozen for above. So these are disjunctive concepts, and they're, they're pretty complicated in terms of number of disjuncts. 
uh, wears similar kind of phenomena. Okay, now qualitative representations also give you ways of talking about causal laws that are like mathematics. F equals MA, let me do it on time here. Yeah, I'm gonna rush a little bit. Um, F equals MA is a great equation, but it's not incremental and it takes a lot of data. So if you think about it in terms of these two statements, which I could learn incrementally by language or by observation, acceleration is qualitatively proportional to force. That is, if this is bigger, all else being equal, that's gonna be bigger. Acceleration is qualitatively inversely proportional to mass. If this is bigger, acceleration will be smaller. It gives you a way of factoring out that information in a more learnable way. And that means we've been able to use it to model things like conceptual change. So using Cox sketch and natural language to describe sequences of, of states in a behavior, Scott Friedman showed that it could learn intuitive models of force that follows a trajectory similar to human students. So these things were tested by having sketches and you'd compare the answers. At one point, human children, if you ask them is the, if you've got a book here on a table, is there a force on the book from the table? And they say no. And the reason they say no is because if the table were pushing on the book, the book would be rising and it doesn't. Okay, and at one point, in fact, the companion goes through exactly that same misconception in its learning how the domain works. Um, here's my all time favorite example, the day night cycle. You have day, sun coming down, and here's different explanations that children actually give. So you, one possibility for night is the moon blocks the sun. Great, what do you do about moonless nights? Um, clouds could block the sun, okay? You could have a clear day. The sun just turns off, click, like a light switch. Yes, indeed, children say this. My all-time favorite is the sun enters the earth because when it's sundown, you can see it going inside the earth. And so that must be what's happening for day night. And then there's the boring, scientifically correct one of the earth rotates. Now, the person who did this, Stelopos Niadnu, was Greek. And she's trying to figure out how to help students really, really understand um, the, the correct model. So she naturally came up with Eros as an analogy. So the sun is the fire, the earth is the meat, and as the meat rotates, different sides of it are facing the sun, and those are day, and the ones facing the way are night. And in fact, the companion, you start it in any of these states, and you give it this analogy, it gets to the correct state. Um, it does It does also suspect that um, the earth is made of something like beef or something like lamb, in addition to the things you wanted to conclude. Um, analogy is very powerful. Okay, so let's talk about analogical learning more broadly for a minute. So analogy is incremental. Even one case can be used to draw new conclusions. And analogical journalization by removing irrelevant things helps promote transfer. It's data and training efficient. And, and uh, by that, I mean sometimes orders of magnitude less data than deep learning. I'll show you one example of that. And usually a single pass of the data versus multiple epochs. And the models are inspectable. These probable, probabilistic relational models are much easier to understand than tensors or vectors or matrices. Now, one drawback, sometimes in head to head comparisons with deep learning systems, our performance can be lower. But actually, sometimes it can actually be higher. It varies. So let me show you how we're using this to learn those higher levels of language interpretation. So the language system I showed you is very general, but how do we make it automatically adapt to new domains? So, so without annotating data, by the way, thousands for representation, not one penny for annotated training data, is my group's slogan. And we want high data efficiency. So here's what we came up with. So we have questions and answers in natural language, and we let the language system do its thing to construct possible interpretations for each. Then we use a connection, we build a connection graph automatically between them and use those to construct what we call query cases that can be applied by analogy to interpret novel questions. 
So I'm gonna show you how this works in GeoQuery, a classic machine learning data set. So here's a training question. Which capitals are in states that border Texas? Now, capital could mean money. Capital state could be state of matter, like solid liquid gas. Border could mean all sorts of things. But these are all cities which pin down particular meanings for these things to make sense. And here's a second training question. What rivers are in Utah? Well, Colorado is a state as well as a river. Green is a color. San Juan is a city. But in fact, the river interpretation is the only thing compatible with this question. Now, just those two training questions, just two, nothing else. You can already answer what rivers flow through states that Alabama borders. What are cities and states through which the Mississippi flows? And then what are cities and states, the border states through which the Mississippi flows, okay? So, so if you have compositional representations and you have a tower of representations you're building on, you can use analogy to very rapidly learn ways to extend that. How rapidly is rapidly? Um, so we get 58% correct with only 10 training examples. This is going, this is having the system because it's inspectable, right? We can have a program that looks over a random training trial, figure out which cases require which other cases, and automatically construct an optimal learning sequence. You can do that after the fact, but you can't do that before the fact. But you see, like even 10 examples, you're already at 58%. And you basically max out around 50 questions. So that's very data efficient. Now, one of the ways we've used this is an interactive kiosk. This is actually deployed in the computer science department in Northwestern. It's been in daily use since 2018. Full stack language understanding, vision and speech interaction. Um, training took an entire five minutes on a tablet. Okay. 11 question answer pairs uh, per question type on average. We're very excited about this. Now, the next step here is um, remember, we want to build a social organism, right? So it's illegal to try to recognize people based on their voice or, or image in the state of Illinois without prior written permission. So um, what we're doing is we're actually using an online platform, uh, Microsoft Teams. And um, basically, here what we're trying to do with the social bot is try to build models of people in order to befriend them. We have the first, in fact, human subjects protocol that I know of where we actually are trying to build software to befriend people. And so um, they're basically just trying to learn about their interest in computer science so it can recommend courses and also uh, talks. Their preferences for food and beverage because a lot of students want to know where they can get free food with talks. Not so much online these days, right? Um, and one of the things we're doing is using new work we've been doing on social and moral norms to help ensure the system behaves appropriately. We're very aware of things like Microsoft Tay and, and the sort of garbage that the language models can produce. And we think that by building in moral norms, we'll be able to prevent that kind of interaction. Now, we've also been using this for learning by reading. So the idea is learning generic facts, like purr is a sound made by cats. You train with things like that, and it can learn things like dogs make different sounds, including barking, to get animal type make sound type dog barking sound. So this scheme basically um, uses our language parser um, with a little bit of BERT in some conditions, and has done a reasonable job at learning from simple English Wikipedia entries. Let me just show you the results. So CNN relation extraction, not so good. BERT, not so good. T5, not so good. These are strong baselines, right? These are strong purity learning baselines. Analogy, 46%. So that's awesome. Now, analogy plus BERT, 71%. Now, what's BERT doing for us? So I mentioned FrameNet. So there's some training data around from the FrameNet people. And by using BERT to actually nudge the language system, 
with extra evidence, it made better choices on parsing. The second thing it does is 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 more of a hack. I mean, this I think is is realistic, but it also takes the natural language generation version of something and uses BERT to estimate how likely that statement is to be true. Okay, now let's let's start stepping back here. So I want to give you a meta analogy. So feature vectors are the dot products as relational representations are the SME. Now, a lot of machine learning algorithms are based on feature vectors and dot product. So the idea is, well, if you think about this analogy, what facts align can be considered dimensions. So I can take existing machine learning techniques and make relational versions of them using SME. And we've actually done this already. So you can use analogical generalization by basically setting the simulation threshold to zero to build joint probability tables from which you can construct automatically based net statistical rules from relational representations. Um, SME can be used as a kernel in support vector machines to improve recognition accuracy. I don't know if it's better than our part-based scheme, but certainly in terms of apples to apples comparisons, the support vector machine version worked the best. Um, and the final example of this is knowledge base completion. So, you know, given the new knowledge base, you want to estimate is Barack Obama a Kenyan? That's false. Is he a United States person? That's true. And traditional machine learning techniques to this problem convert the structured representations from free base or um, WordNet to take the two classic examples and convert them to distributed representation and then train as usual for deep learning. What we did instead was use analogical generalization but add structured logistic regression. Why? Because analogy lets you know when things are similar. It doesn't let you know that this property is actually strong negative evidence for something. Okay, So it doesn't ever give you a way to interpret negative evidence. I mean, it does slightly if you talk about near miss learning, but I'm, I'm not going to go into near miss learning now. And so the idea is we constructed cases, it built generalizations, and the weights got adjusted by gradient descent, but by using SME instead of dot product. And it turns out state of the art performance, it was second on both leaderboards, no system dominated it. And traditional methods required 10,000 examples per relation. And a logical approach required only 10. Okay, so we, we really do think this is a, a, a way better way to approach things. So I've argued that qualitative representations support human like learning and reasoning. And so, I've shown you examples from visual reasoning and object recognition, STEM reasoning and learning, modern conceptual change. I didn't discuss the work we've done in social reasoning, blame assignment, moral decision making thinking about the strategic reasoning and strategy games, decision-making and cognitive architectures, how to use this to support learning by experimentation, um, and similarly analogy, super general. We've seen it used in a lot of ways in this talk. I didn't talk about our theory of mind model, which Irina Rupkina shows, explains a number of phenomena as well as being able to be used by artificial agents, um, how to use analogy and resolving referring expressions, learning linguistic instructions, analogical chaining for common sense reasoning. And, and the idea is the structure mapping models of matching, retrieval, and generalization are new technology for machine learning. They're broadly compatible with how people reason and learn. They're incremental, inspectable, and dating and training efficient. And they can be engineered to provide complementary cognitive strengths for human partners. Okay, and the one path we see to human-like AI is software social organisms using QR and analogy with apprenticeship. So one thing we're looking at, given who we are, is, is basically um, having systems learn from people as students with shared notebooks between the two of them. So in the bottom left here, you see a description of how insulin works in human physiology. On the right, you see someone analyzing uh, behavior where they start with the raw data, 
they have segmented data, there's a qualitative description. And the idea is when we sketch, we have multiple kinds of things in the same sketch. By providing a little bit of scaffolding here, we can make it easier for the machines to understand us. And the idea is you have systems co-learning with human students and learning on the job as a way of, of getting to human-like AI. Okay. Thank you for listening. <laughs>